So those of us in the know about Brexit knew exactly, exactly what is happening at this very moment. Because there is an attempt by the government and indeed much of the right wing media to try and cover things up. There was an article not too long ago uh, in The Sun, I think it was, about the Honda plant celebrating how much wonderful the Honda plant was being while not mentioning at all that over 3,000 jobs were being lost at the plant because of Brexit. We had only just a couple of weeks ago three, three quote, businesses picked for their success of this post-Brexit bonanza that had been uh, that had been supposedly sold, but upon further looking at these three companies, they weren't really making that much of a benefit or even that much of a difference, really post Brexit. Indeed, they were no figures to go by, and as a result, and I have said this all the time, the government is desperate, desperate this year to try and prove that Brexit is some sort of success, and. You may well, very well may remember uh, the one Daniel Hanan who infamously said that only a fool would consider leaving the single market. And yet here we are now run by a complete ship of fools with a complete clown at the helm. And the direction that we are going in is not very good at all. This is only going to damage our economy, not just in the short term, not just in the medium term, but in the long term and permanently. Everything that they're talking about are that are, quote, teething issues are not teething issues. These are permanent problems. All this paperwork that lots of companies are complaining about, that's not going to go away. That's not going to miraculously be fixed overnight. And even when companies actually get to grips with the paperwork, that cost will still be there. And it doesn't matter if you're sending a physical product. It also counts to services for like my own uh, marketing services that, you know, I work in. If I want to work with someone in Europe, I now have to fill out a form to basically show that my my skills in particular are not available in Europe and that the, that company themselves then has to justify why they're going outside the European Union. And again, it's a cost to them, not only in the paperwork, but the time as well to actually do it, which now makes European, you know, UK companies uncompetitive in the European market, where at once they had a very level playing field with everyone else. So we now have to consider where we go from here. And trust me, the government are doing everything they can to try and cover it up. As you know, the Brexit committee was disbanded in January, which was shocking. It really was, because this was the committee that was going to chart what was happening for Brexit. And of course, the Conservatives can't have anybody telling them what's really going on in Brexit. But luckily, they do not have control over what goes on in the House of Lords. And as a result, the uh, Lords Committee for the Future of the EU, as I think it's called, is going to be there. And trust me when I say that this, I think, is going to be the thorn in the Tory side coming very, very quickly and soon. So, uh, before we jump into that, please do remember to hit that like and share button. And of course, down below, there is a link to my Patreon page, as well as a one-off donation link called Buy Me a Coffee, where you can, well, buy me a coffee. And thank you to all those people who do support me that way. And so, on with today's article. So, this one comes from the Yorkshire Bylines. The title is Beyond Brexit. The Lord's EU Select Committee, Conclusions and Recommendations. You'd be forgiven for thinking that the government prefers to avoid scrutiny at all costs, whether it's Brexit or Covid. It's been playing its cards close to its chest. Bills have been rushed through Parliament at breakneck speed, and any criticism has been countered with suggestions that there is nothing to fear, as the government has it covered and can be trusted to do the right thing. 
Those uh, uh, that welcome the scrutiny provided by Hillary Benn's House of Commons Committee on the Future Relationship with the EU, commonly referred to as the Brexit Committee, were disappointed when it was disbanded in January. The House of Lords equivalent, however, the EU Select Committee, is also about to close down to be replaced by the new Lords European Affairs Committee. Whilst the chair and its members of the new committee are expected to be formed at the beginning of April, they are still unknown. It is very likely that all the existing members will just move across to this new forum. So let's go over some of the things that they've uh, published. So this is the first one, Beyond Brexit Report 1, The Institutional Framework. The first report published on March 22nd speaks of haste with which the trade and cooperation agreement was agreed, resulting in many new items of unfinished business. Those items include regulatory cooperation on finances, suitable practical arrangements on asylum, and as agreed to complete uh, negotiations as soon as reasonably predict possible. In reference to the decisions uh, of to unilaterally extend grace periods, the committee concludes that the government has no has not so under has so undermined the trust that the possibility of a no deal, in other words, the failure to ratify the TCA has now resurfaced. So they're basically saying that because we are doing that and extending these grace periods, the threat of a no deal has once again become a reality and is indeed staring us in the face. And judging by the fact that, once again, Lord Frost is out there frosting things up, um, uh, things aren't going to go well because the government are absolutely determined, determined to make sure that the, the Northern Ireland Protocol does not work. So, the next report. Food, Environment, Health and Energy. The report expresses relief that the TCA achieved the tariff and quota free uh, through significant barriers to trade still exist. Those barriers um, uh, have, be, have reduced the profitability of parts of the Great Britain's food and agricultural sector and that the committee recommends the government seek to, su to supplementary agreements with the EU. The committee is dismayed that agri-food sector is facing increased trade frictions and says that the sector is in very, facing very difficult challenges thanks to increased paperwork and preparation required for food. Um, lots of the talk around this essentially is suggesting that they are refusing to do any deals at the moment with the EU because they are desperate to do deals with the US. And currently any deals that they might do with the EU may put off, shall we say, significant portions of them trying to get a good deal with the US. Because as we've said before, the deal with the US was the golden calf of Brexit. It was the one everyone wanted, the one every Brexiteer talked about, how wonderful it would be. And yet, as we've said before, this would only grant us about 1% of extra GDP, which again would replace us nothing of the GDP that we lose from being in the European Union and being in the single market and customs union. <laughs> you know, that's just basic economics. And as always, when it comes to you strip away any of the political arguments, regardless, remain, leave, whatever, and you simply look at the cold, hard economic numbers, it does not make any sense for Brexit at all. Of course, on fisheries, the comment the, com the committee has disagreed with the government's assessment that UK fisheries will have a 25% more quota in five and a half years time, saying that the real figure is just 16.6% and that the species whose quota will increase are not necessarily those of value to the UK fishing industry. <laughs> well, we knew that. <laughs> we knew that was coming. On the health, uh, the committee appreciates the new arrangements for UK citizens uh, when travelling as well as tariff-free exports for medicines and medical equipment. But regarding staffing issues in the NHS and social care that have exasperated, been exasperated by the pandemic, the committee sees no evidence of a credible plan from the government to address the shortage. 
Although it supports measures to encourage more homegrown care workers, it says that such measures will take years to materialise and is near, and the need currently is immediate. Again, doesn't look good for that one. So, report three, trade in services. With the service industries accounting for around 80% of the UK's economic output in 2019, there are they are completely central to the economy. And the report says that whilst the TCAs is preferable to no agreement, significant challenges remain. The financial sector contributes over $132 billion to the UK economy. That's about 6.9% of the total economic output and more than 10% of the UK tax receipts. The exit from the passporting regime has already resulted in the move of activity and jobs to the EU, which in time may lead to further export of people and assets. And we've seen today that the Bank of England is now asking um, for these companies to seek permission from the Bank of England to leave. And here's the thing. They don't have to get permission from the Bank of England if they want to relocate over to the EU. <laughs> you know, they do not have to ask its permission at all. So, again, another fabulous Brexit benefit. I thought everyone was meant to be coming here. Why are we seeing all these financial institutions leave the UK? Um, so, while the TCA does alleviate some of the uncertainty for professionals and business services, it represents a major change from single market membership. UK service providers are facing a patchwork of complicated rules which act as a barrier to trade, hitting smaller businesses the hardest. Tourism and travel sectors will be particularly hard hit by undermining opportunities, especially for young people. What a surprise. The lack of recognition of, of professional qualifications is disappointing and this could affect many sectors. The committee urges the government to seek an arrangement with the EU to resolve this issue. Um, the report does not recommend divergence from EU regulation for divergence's sake alone, nor alignment for alignment's sake as well. The creative industry sector was worth over £100 billion in 2019 and it grew twice the rate of the rest of the UK economy and employed over 2 million people. Beyond the financial benefits, the committee notes that the thriving creative industry sector brings a sense of pride, community and joy, as well as promoting UK values and soft power abroad. The committee was deeply concerned about the impact of loss of freedom of movement it is having on the sector, making touring prohibitively bureaucratic and expensive. It urges the government to negotiate a bilateral and reciprocal agreement that as a matter of urgency to make mobility agreements for touring platformers and creative teams and crews more easy. On research and education, the committee also respects the government decision not to participate in the Erasmus scheme and draws attention to the shortcomings of the replacement touring scheme, namely that it makes no provision for inbound student mobility and does not cover tuition fees or travel costs. It also expresses concern about the costs of the new scheme and says that there are significant gaps in the current proposals. The committee also notes that the future relationship with the EU would be critical to continuing success for the UK's research and education programmes. Number four, uh, trade in goods. The committee recognises that the TCA is preferable to a no-deal outcome, but that it does not ratify single regulatory logistical and administrative barriers to trade arising from the UK's status as a third country. It suggests an ambitious approach to trade with the EU and urges both parties to work together in a spirit of cooperation and openness. The government's comment to maintaining high labour and social standards is welcome and should any change to these standards be con uh, considered in the future, the report recommends caution, transparency and consultation. Amongst the biggest issues facing traders are both rules of origin requirements which represent both short-term administration issues and long-term structural challenges. Businesses have little time to adapt and implementation has been exasperated by administrative difficulties. The government is advised to ensure full awareness of the need to follow the rules and to embark on a programme of industrial engagement to identify and pursue solutions 
to the uh, uh, to the adhered problems. The rules of origin requirements mean that substantial supply supply chain shift is certainly in certain sectors is likely, adding significant costs to many UK businesses as well as exports in developing countries. Traders in animal and plant products have been perhaps the hardest hit by additional red tape. Many of their products cannot be stockpiled and therefore makes the most stringent of checks. Physical and sanitary and cytosanitary measures could become a permanent barrier to trade, unless both parties can agree to mitigation to the current scheme. And again, the government is advised to seek the agreement for the trusted trader scheme to enable some businesses to benefit from simplifications to customs or safety and security procedures. The funding for development of physical customs infrastructure has been insufficient and further funding should be released before checks are imposed. The government must adopt a pragmatic approach in border, in border inspections as new requirements are phased in. Nothing is surprised there. So Breakers Report 5. Policing, Law Enforcement and Security. The final report was published on the 26th of March and welcomes provisions for sharing uh, of passenger record data between the UK and the EU and for continued UK access to EU databases covering fing fingerprints, DNA, criminal records and agreement on extraditional arraignments. They are also welcome comments to the rule of, of law and the European Convention of Human Rights described as essential elements of the TCA and data protection rights. Should the UK decide in the future not to stay aligned with EU data protection rules, the agreements could be suspended or even terminated, which is hugely important for, our, for my specs in, in especially. The committee notes that it is unavoidable, uh, the notes and unavoidable consequences of the agreement that if it is no longer provides the same level co of collaboration as whether the UK was an EU member state. The influence and leadership the UK previously enjoyed in shaping instruments of EU law, enforcement and judicial cooperation have ended. One of the most significant consequences is the loss of the Schengen information system and the real-time access to data it provided. This data included person objects of interest and wanted or missing persons. The committee says there are many reasons to be cautious about drawing conclusions as to the effectiveness of the TCA in practice. Nothing that many of the provisions of the agreement are detailed and complex and untried at the moment. So, you know, that is a big loss to us, not being in that. So what does this all really mean? So... What comes across time and time again in the five reports is the fact that there is still much work to be do and to be done. The importance of maintaining good relations with the EU cannot be understated. Recent UK government actions have caused considerable frictions and are counterproductive for a good working partnership. The government must make every effort to undo the damage and rebuild trust and goodwill between the two parties. And... I don't think that's going to happen, especially, especially with this government. It is going to do everything it possibly can to try and damage this relationship as much as possible because it wants to try and pretend that the EU isn't there while focusing on the fantasy land that it's built for itself. And sooner or later, as always, fantasy is no substitute for reality. And reality always wins in these types of situations and sooner or later there are going to be a lot and i mean a lot of the conservative party that are so angry of what these current members in the parliamentary party have done to their businesses there is going to 